for joining the NeedyMed special topic webinar, 10 Myths About Raynaud's Phenomenon, Get the Facts for a Warmer, More Comfortable Life. My name is Carla, and I am the Director of Education and Partnerships at NeedyMed. Before we get started, I'm going to make a few suggestions so you can make the most out of today's presentation. You can feel free to type any questions you may have into the questions section of your GoToWebinar control panel, but know we will reserve answering questions until the end. If we don't have time to answer your question, we will follow up with you personally via email. Of course, you can always reach out to the Raynaud's Association or NeedyMeds, and I will provide the contact information for both organizations again at the end. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the NeedyMeds YouTube channel. And you can also find the PowerPoint slide decks accompanying this presentation in the handout section of your control panel. So let's get started with what is NeedyMeds. What you are looking at is our mission statement, a statement about how we achieve our mission, and our vision statement. But simply put, NeedyMeds connects people to programs that will help them afford their healthcare expenses. And we do that free and anonymously through our website, needymeds.org, and our helpline, 1-800-503-6897. Up on your screen now is a screenshot of our homepage. And I always like to put that up because really our website is the face of our organization. It also gives me a chance to point out a few resources you may be interested in. If you are looking for ways to save on your healthcare expenses, check out the Patient Savings tab. If you're interested in signing up to receive our monthly newsletter, ordering educational materials and brochures, seeing what other webinars are scheduled, visit the Advocates tab. You can also see other upcoming webinars by visiting the calendar of events on the bottom right hand of our homepage. I mentioned that this webinar is being recorded and will be added to our YouTube channel, and you can find a link to our YouTube channel on the top right of our homepage with the rest of the social media icons. It's the third one from the left. Anyway, as you saw in a previous slide, the NeedyMeds mission is to educate and empower those seeking affordable health care. And we define education in two ways. One, by educating people about NeedyMeds and the resources we offer, and two, by letting them know about other helpful resources and timely healthcare topics, which is why we are so pleased to have our guest from the Raynaud's Association here with us today. So let me tell you a bit about the Raynaud's Association. They're a national nonprofit whose mission is to provide support and education to the millions of sufferers of Raynaud's phenomenon and exaggerated sensitivity to cold temperatures. And it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Jan Nitty. Jan is a board member of Raynaud's Association and a leader of the Scleroderma Tampa Area Support Group. Jan is an expert professionally, but also personally, as she was diagnosed with scleroderma and secondary Raynaud's in 2002. She is the author of Be Your Best Advocate, Improving Your Life with Scleroderma and Autoimmune Disease and holds a master's degree in public health and a bachelor's in biology medical technology. So with that resume, you can see why we are so pleased to have Jan with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic and the screen, hopefully seamlessly to Jan. Bear with us while we do that and while Jan grabs the screen. And as she does that, I wanna remind everyone that again, if you do have any questions throughout Jan's presentation, you can go ahead and type them into that question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. And with that, as soon as Jan puts that slideshow into from start on the left-hand side, I will pass the mic right to her. Enjoy today's presentation, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Well, welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today. And thank you, Carla, for that wonderful description of me. <laughs> yes, I am a sufferer of Raynaud's for 18 years now. So this is a passion um, that I've had to try and find ways to reduce uh, Raynaud's attacks. So I'm happy to share with you today my learnings and things that 
we have developed and, and found out through the Raynaud's Association. But before we get into the myths about Raynaud's phenomenon, I wanted to just briefly discuss what Raynaud's is. There's a lot of misconception out there about why, why do I have Raynaud's and is it normal for the body? Well, Raynaud's is actually um, an exaggerated normal part of one of the processes of the body. So I'm gonna give you a little picture here. Think about when your body is threatened by, it could be an emotional threat or something really serious like someone coming at you. You have a built-in automatic system okay, that it will be triggered during a threat to prepare you to either confront or flee from the threat. It is called the flight or fight response. And what happens is when you're exposed to a threat, again, it could be an emotional threat, there's a lot of things going on in your body. Your heart rate increases, your blood pressure increases, your pupils dilate, the non-essential systems like your digestive tract and your immune system actually can shut down to allow more energy for emergency functions. Your muscles tent up from all the, there's a lot of hormones being released um, and your sugar levels go up. And one thing in particular, your veins in your skin will constrict to send more blood to the major muscle organs and that means less blood will be in the skin to keep you warm. So as we go through the presentation today, let's just keep in mind some of the things that are happening to us when we have a Raynaud's attack and maybe we can identify some triggers that we could help to minimize. So myth number one, Raynaud's is a rare disease. Well, in order for something to be a rare disease, it has to affect fewer than 200,000 people in the United States, which is one in about 1,500 people. Well, Raynaud's actually affects 15 to 30 million people. That's five to 10% of the US population. A lot of people are unaware of it. In fact, one tenth of it. So it's very important to understand that it's not a rare disease and a lot of people have it. And especially women of childbearing age, 20% of them have Raynaud's. Let's go to myth number two. There is a formal test to diagnose Raynaud's. Now there are a lot of different tests out there that the doctors use nowadays. They're part of their diagnosis tool. They'll use different x-rays, blood tests, whatnot, to help diagnose what's going on in a person that's suffering. But there is actually no formal test for diagnosing primary Raynaud's. Okay, I'm gonna get into it a little bit more later about primary and secondary Raynaud's, but there is no formal test for primary Raynaud's. Doctors may use different kinds of testing procedures to try and trigger your Raynaud's episode. For example, there's a thermal imaging test out there that's a heat sensitivity technique. Yet, it's not 100% because you have to have an attack when you're having the test done. There's also the cold water, water trigger test, and I could contest to this. I did a, a presentation and a demonstration to workers in a healthcare setting, and we had them go through the cold water test where they submerged their hands in water and then took them out, and we would see the response to their hands if there was any color changes. So those are some little tests that the doctor may do. If the doctor is suspicious that there might be something going on causing the secondary Raynaud's to occur, he may do such things as look at the nail fold under a microscope to look for abnormalities of capillaries or any kind of deformalities or enlargements of the tissues around the skin. The classic text, textbook test, the anti-nuclear antibody test, also known as ANA, is used as a screening for primary and secondary conditions, meaning you have an ANA positive, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean that you have a secondary condition causing the, your rheumatoid, or your, your um, excuse me, your Raynaud's, but the doctor can use that first test, the ANA test, to kind of get an idea and actually look at further testing from that to determine if it's primary Raynaud's or secondary Raynaud's. So keep that in mind. When you get your ANA test, if the doctor does it, um, to keep a benchmark, know what your original 
number is. And beware, there are false positives to that, so just keep that in mind. Myth number three, Ray nose affects only fingers and toes. Well, I can, I can tell you that I have Ray nose um, in many different areas of my body, on my ears, I have them on my nose, my tongue has had a Ray nose attack, and believe it or not, um, women's breasts and sex organs can actually get affected. That's why um, they say that during the flight and fight response, you should look at other areas of your body, not maybe just your hands, but look at your toes or just keep an eye on what your body's going through all extremities, not just your fingers and your hands. Myth number four, brain node sufferers have poor circulation. There's a lot of confusion here because a lot of people are like, oh, my hands turn colors in the winter. I think I just have poor circulation. Well, primary brain node sufferers, 90% of them have a normal vascular function and circulation. So that means that if you have primary brain nodes, there's nothing wrong going on with your vascular functions. If there might be a secondary condition, a secondary vascular condition, say for example, like carpal tunnel or whatnot, but 90% of primary brain nodes is not a vascular condition. Now there are different things out there that can um, lead to a brain nodes attacks. For example, certain jobs like construction working, Drilling, any kind of repetitive pressure on the hands can cause a Raynaud's episode. And those conditions really have to be evaluated per, per, per person and look at the damage if there's any to blood vessels. So we're gonna go into flight and flight responses and that's where we'll talk about the different things that could cause you to have a Raynaud's attack. Myth number five. Raynaud's is an allergy to the cold. Okay, so what's the definition of an allergy? It's something that causes rashes, you get itchy, you're red. It can even look like you have a little skin disease. Raynaud's is not an allergy to the cold. There is a condition called cold urticaria where you get rashing, you get rashes and itching, but Raynaud's is not being allergic to the cold. You're being triggered by the cold, but you're not allergic to the cold. Myth number six, <clears throat> Raynaud's is merely a nuisance and not a medical condition. Okay, so let's get back and just talk about primary and secondary Raynaud's. When you have primary Raynaud's, there's no underlying cause. It's just something that you have. And you learn how to modifications in your lifestyle or to medication to deal with the changes in the color. I have a lot of friends that are runners and they have primary Raynaud's and it comes and goes, and they're able to handle it. Now, secondary rain nodes <clears throat> is caused from an underlying condition. Say, for example, scleroderma. I have had scleroderma for 19 years. I was diagnosed with rain nodes, which led to the diagnosis of scleroderma. So you really have to understand which rain nodes you have. Do you have primary and secondary so that you can respond correctly? When I was first diagnosed, everyone thought I was crazy. My family were like, what's the matter with your hands? I was like, oh, they have so much pain. They're like, oh, stop complaining. There's nothing really wrong because they're unaware that it is a medical condition. And some doctors too, if you go to the doctors and you're like, look, my hands are turning colors. I don't know what to do. Well, one suggestion I have for you is to take pictures of your hands and take them to the doctor because you may not have an episode when you're with them and then he really can't visualize what's going on with the color changes in your hands and pain levels. Avoid attacks. You know, there's a lot of things that will cause you to have an attack. Not just cold weather, it could be changes from hot to cold very quickly. Say you're in the supermarket and it's cold and then you come out of the supermarket and it's warm, you could have a rain nose attack. Stress, there's not enough to be said about stress and what it can do to the body, how it affects the hormone levels in your body and how hormones are actually, there is a little bit of a link now between hormones and Raynaud's attacks and then lifestyle changes. Look at your life. What's around you? Are there things around you that could be acting as a stress factor to you? Friends, situations, are you in a stressful work environment? You know, we want you to live better. So we're hoping that if we can identify 
these stress factors and lifestyle changes, we can find ways to minimize attacks. Myth number seven, Rain Ode's episodes always involve the patriotic white, blue, and red color changes. That's the textbook definition of it. But I can tell you as a sufferer, you can have many different types of Rain Ode's attacks. Sometimes I'll just be, my fingers will just turn white. Okay, that means that the blood is leaving the area of your fingers or your other extremities. If you go to the blue red response, so blue means that, okay, my blood flow has been compromised and now I'm having oxygen depletion. This is a very important, um, you need to recognize this. It's very important because during that time is when you can have tissue damage if you go to that blue response. And then as the blood flow goes back into the extremities, you'll go back to the red. One of the things I like to note is if I'm having a Raynaud's attack, when it starts, what stage do I get to, and then how fast does it end? We want to make sure we're not in that blue response for long periods of time because we got to worry about tissue damage. There are, all, there are milder attacks. Like I said, you could just go, go white, and then you could have the more severest purple. I, go, I can go right into a purple one in two seconds and stay there, but be out of it quickly, which is a good thing. You could have a reddish and a pink pattern. So everyone's different. We all have different responses and that could, your you might not have the same color changes as other sufferers. Myth number eight, the only treatment for Raynaud's is to stay warm. Well, there are so many different medications out now there that are being used off label, meaning that they're not really, they weren't, clinically tested for one disease, but they're, they're actually, they help with other diseases as well. And these are some of the medications I'm gonna take you through, but there are others that if you really wanna know more about it, you can talk to your doctor. The first one is medications that increase blood flow to the extremities. For example, calcium channel blockers, like Procardia, or the generic is called methenapine. There are erectile dysfunction drugs, which believe me, they work. I take Sidenafil, which is one of them, and it's a Viagra for women. I take it three times a day. And it really helps me to keep blood flow to my extremities. One time, I'll share with you, I had one finger that kept on staying in the purple mode, and uh, the doctor gave me Viagra, samples of Viagra, and, it, and within a week, everything was back to normal. So. You gotta think outside the box with this, but there are medications that you can get um, through your health insurance. For example, sildenafil and calcium channel blocker, blockers. One thing to remember here though is if you're on a lot of medication, you really should go through all your medication and make sure that some of them couldn't be aggravating blood vessels. For example, there's migraine medication out there that could actually aggravate the blood vessels and cause you to have a Raynaud's attack. Um, there's certain beta blockers out there that might aggravate the symptoms. Maybe you want to change to a calcium channel blocker if you're having um, problems with your um, your heart pressure. And antidepressants are another one that's not listed here, but I have to tell you that I started an antidepressant when I first was diagnosed. And I was like, why am I going on antidepressant? Doctor's like, well, it'll help with your stress and your Raynaud's attack. And I never really realized how important it was for me to take that around, I guess, two months ago, I tried to go off it. And it was unbelievable, the attacks I was having. And I was getting hot flashes because I'm menopausal. So there's a lot to be said by thinking outside the box and looking at other medications. There's a procedure that you could get, which is called a digital sympathectomy. It's a surgery where they go into your fingers and they actually manipulate the sympathetic nervous system so that it continuously blood flows into the fingers. It's really for severe cases. I've seen many people that have had it and some have had great responses and other um, have had um, the nerve endings grow back. So it's something that you really wanna consider if you're at the last point of with your finger. Self-help techniques, I'm sure everybody is very aware by the fact of how to reduce stress and how to just make yourself calm down if you're having an attack. 
deep breathing works wonders for me. I sit down in a chair, I take a tough couple deep breaths, and I just focus on the blood flow going back into my hands, going back into my feet, and it really does help. Yoga is another fantastic technique used to help bring circulation to the areas and even um, meditations. But you'll find what best works for you, but you have to really think about, you know, can I, can I sit at my desk and, and take a break for five minutes and just do some breathing exercises? Of course you can. Little things like that can help you get through an attack now, there's also natural and holistic remedies. However, they're not clinically verified. What does that mean? That means that the sample size on some of these remedies has been so small that there's not enough data for it to be clinically significant. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. It's just saying that clinically they haven't been verified. So anything that you want to take over the counter or if you want to look into a holistic approach, I would definitely discuss it with your doctor. Make sure that anything that you're taking is not going to interfere with the medications that you're on and really look into the side effects of, of medications that could, that could have with other ones. There's different kinds of reactions that can happen. Myth number nine, Raynaud's is only an issue in cold climates and cold seasons. Well, about four years ago, I decided to leave New Jersey because it was so cold. And I'm like, I'm going to move to a warmer climate and I'll be better. Well, that was the farthest thing that happened to me, I have to say. Um, when, you, when you think about your exposure to cold, uh, we all know air conditioning, certain outdoor activities will cause it, swimming, holding a cold glass, reaching into a refrigerator. The problem is this, is those things won't go away. Like I have more air conditioning here that they may not go away. I have more air conditioning here than I did in New Jersey. And holding a cold glass, I don't even have to hold a cold glass anymore. I could just actually drink something cold and have a Raynaud's attack. So any exposure to any cold or any kind of drastic cha temperature change can cause an attack. And every ones are different. Stress. I don't know how much more I can emphasize stress and you have to look at your support system. So I'll just another example, when I moved, I left my support system back in New Jersey. I had my some family here, but not my total support system. Think about who your support system is. It's your doctors, your friends, your um, colleagues at work. It could be uh, your, your gym, even people at your gym, all of those different things, your pharmacist. I mean, there's so many different things in your lifestyle that if you're thinking about leaving, think about the support systems that you're going to be giving up and how long it could take to create a new support system. Myth number 10. Raynaud's sufferers are only likely to lose fingers and toes. And this is really an exaggerated um, thought, meaning that it's the likelihood that you're going to lose a finger or a toe from a Raynaud's attack is very, very rare. So I wouldn't worry about that so much. Um, less than 10% have serious conditions. It's when you have a secondary condition, like a digital ulcer. Then you have to worry about Maybe you need to go on antibiotics if there's an infection. How am I going to keep blood flow to that area? Make sure I was keeping it the area warm. And ulcers will eventually heal. If an infection does occur, you see the doctor and he will work with you on maybe doubling your medication or other things to help, help those digital ulcers, ulcers cure. And then manage through avoidance techniques and lifestyle changes. Again, you know, don't worry about the small things, worry about the big things. And one of the things that should be a priority for you is looking at things you can avoid to cause, to trigger an attack. Like I know that if I'm going to the supermarket, I'm wearing my muff, I got hand warmers in there. I even wear a hat sometimes. I know people probably think I'm crazy. I live in Florida, but I wear a hat and I'm like, who cares? You gotta do what you gotta do, right? Now, I know that Carla talked about the Raynaud's Association, but I just wanted to go into this a little bit more. So there's a woman, her name is Lynn Wonderman. 
I met her back in the 1900s, and she is in the 90s, sorry. <laughs> She's the president and the co-chair of the Reynolds Association. She was diagnosed <clears throat> in 1992, and she started the Reynolds organization in 1990 and 1992, and she had three people. Now she has over 5,400 members. And she literally answers the toll-free hotline. I'm gonna give you the number. You can call her and ask her anything. She's so, she has so much information to give and very, very helpful. And if she can't get you the answer, she'll try in other ways. Her the number is 800 280 That's 800 So that's one of the many benefits that you have with the Reynolds Association. Membership is free. We ask for donations, but membership is free. And one of the things you get with the membership is you get discount on products. We have a store. If you'd like to go and look in there, we have different kinds of warming devices warming techniques that we use and there's a discount the other thing to keep in mind is that we what we do is we get products from outside from other from vendors and we'll try them and give feedback and then we won't make any recommendations unless we really truly believe that they're going to help and there's many there's more than one there's four or five of us that will look at different kinds of um product reviews and make decisions and will educate you on them as well. We also have a lot of resources. There's a quarterly newsletter. Um, there's a quiz right now. We had our Reynolds Awareness Month in October where um, a thousand people took a quiz and it helps you look at, well, maybe I do just have primary Reynolds or maybe I should look into, you know, am I really having that symptom? I never really thought about it. And then of course, social media. We all go to social media for everything now, don't we? Well, we have over 21,000 people on Facebook that have conversations going on daily about what works for them and what doesn't. We have 3,000 on Twitter, and we have like 20 to 30 um, people a day on Pinterest. So there's a lot of different discussion forums for you to go into and to talk to people about. And we're here all the time, too, to, if you have any questions. So think of it as this. There's learning tools all around you. You have experts who are other sufferers like you that you can lean on. You have the Reynolds Association. I'm, I'm sure you might have other support groups. But we can all learn from each other so that we can live a healthier life and have quality living and not have a fear of, oh, am I going to go to the store? Am I going to go here? Am I going to be cold? We have to educate one another, and then we can help one another. So I, I, if anybody has any questions, I'm done right now. On you can go to www.raynodes.org. You'll find all information about us there. You can make a donation. And um, if there's any questions, I know that Carly is going to take over that. Absolutely. And of course, I want to give a big thank you to Jan for taking time out of her day to share her expertise with the Needy Meds audience. Um, as you can see, not only is Raynaud's and their the Reynolds Association and their board members so chock full of, of up-to-date information and helpful tips on how to live a more comfortable, warmer life, but they're willing to share their own personal stories, which makes them empathetic and a lot more approachable. And I was so pleased to see, and I'm going to remind everybody that if you do have questions, you can go ahead and submit them by typing them into that question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. And I'm so pleased to see that one of the questions that came in, Jan, just before you put up your last slide, was how to stay in touch with Raynodes. So Jan gave you a bunch of information on how, in addition to visiting their website, you can follow them on social media. As you saw, you can sign up for their newsletters. You can become a member for free to get discounted products. So be sure to check them out to see other ways that they can help you. In the meantime, as those questions are going to come in, I want to remind everyone that Needy Meds is here also as a support for you, especially when it comes to being connected with programs that will help you afford or save 
on your healthcare expenses. What you're looking at on your screen now are our most popular cost savings resources, and you can find those and learn more about them by visiting that patient savings tab that I pointed out in the beginning of today's presentation. Of course, you can always reach out to our call center counselors at 1-800-503-6897. So with that, let's go ahead and get to some of the questions coming in. And as we do that, I want to leave up the contact information for both Raynaud's and Needy Meds as promised. So Jan, although you did address this, it's a good opportunity to drive this home. We have an audience member asking, does Raynaud just occur with your hands and feet? Right, okay, so great question, obviously. Uh, no, um, I get Raynaud's attacks on my nose and my ears, on, um, you know, extremities. It can be, it can be as personal as, you know, um, a sex organ, I'm, that's basically it. So it's not just the hands and the feet. My mouth sometimes, will ha when I get really, really cold, my mouth will get a Raynaud's attack and it's hard for me to speak properly. So just think about that. It's not necessarily just the hands. It could be anywhere. And you should really know, you know, really take a look, examine your body and look at where it could possibly, where you might have an attack. Thank you to our audience member for that question, giving Jan the opportunity to really drive that home. And it'll give me an opportunity to also stress that uh, something that Jan mentioned a moment ago, that connecting with other people, whether it's on their website, whether it's reading their newsletter, and really importantly, whether connecting with other people on social media so you don't feel so isolated with the symptoms that you're experiencing may prove really helpful. I also see, Jan, we're getting a number of questions in about whether specific medications can aggravate rain nodes. If somebody has a specific medication that they're concerned that is in fact aggregating this phenomenon, can they check that out through the website? What do you suggest um, that they do to find out whether or not a particular medication is aggravating the symptom? Okay, so let's think about our circle of our support system. You have your pharmacist in there, you have your doctor in there, and you also have other people, other sufferers. Now, I, I just learned about the migraine medication and how that can aggravate, um, aggregate, aggravate an attack. And what I want to do is I'm going to go sit with my pharmacist and say, okay, these are the medications I'm taking, and I have brain nodes attacks. Can we look at some of the side effects? I mean, you can Google um, on the internet and find out if one of the attacks could be it constricts blood vessels, that's what causes Raynaud's attacks. Remember, you're constricting the blood vessels. But I would definitely work with my pharmacist and my doctor, and especially if you're taking anything that's holistic, that could be having a reaction with your drug. So, you know, really think about who can you turn to in your immediate circle, in your support group, in your support system. Great thorough answer, and thank you for our audience for asking it. And I will also chime in to say that on NeedyMeds.org, again, under that patient savings tab, on the top left hand, you'll find a section dedicated to prescription assistance programs. So if you are having trouble affording a name brand medication, please check out that prescription assistance programs section to see if there is a program that will help you get that medication either for free or for a deeply discounted price. The reason I'm bringing up that specific section on needy meds is because in addition to letting you know whether or not a prescription assistance program is available, we also have other icons on that section of our website that will provide more information about that drug. We have support pages, which provide more information about that specific medication. And oftentimes we also have drug videos about specific medications, so it's worth checking out. So do be mindful of, of that. And again, if you don't have access to the internet or would simply rather speak with a live person, don't hesitate to reach out to our call center experts. And that number is on the bottom of your screen right now, and it's 1-800-503-6897. Another question coming in, Jan, is are there specific foods that cause blood vessel constriction and may 
lead to a Raynaud's attack? That's a great question. That's a great question. And I have to say that it's very individualized. Like, of course, if you eat something cold, you, it could trigger something like ice cream or a cold glass of uh, milk or whatnot. But specific foods that will constrict blood vessels, I'm not really aware of any of those. But you should actually, one of the things that you could do is you could start a journal of what you're eating and um, create like a little template there and say, okay, I, did I have an attack when I ate such and such? Like, I know, obviously, when I have ice cream, I'm going to have an attack. So what do I do? I try and eat ice cream outside where it's warm so that I won't have the attack. So it's really very individualized. If you want to start a food log and look at, you know, it's specific to you. I don't, I don't know if there's any specific medic uh, drug food out there that would cause a Raynaud's attack. And that's another important question, and I'm glad our audience member brought it up. Um, and it gives me another opportunity to share another Needy Meds resource that our audience may be interested in. Again, on that Needy Meds website, on the left-hand side towards the bottom, you'll find a box dedicated to Needy Meds Storylines. Storylines is a free self-care app that makes it possible for you to track and manage your health. And it comes preloaded with the Needy Meds drug discount card, which is really useful. But it can also act as a medication reminder, a pain scale, a vitals tracker. But what reminded me to mention this is Jan suggested keeping a journal. That app actually has a journal built into it. So check out, again, Needy Med Storylines, and you'll find a link to it on the bottom left-hand box of our homepage. It'll take you to a page that will provide more information about that app, and it'll let you know how to download it for, for free, which I believe you can do through Google Play or the iTunes Store. So we're going to go ahead and get to one final question, which is, is there a way to address Raynaud's issues for those who use mobility de devices where hands need both dexterity and warmth, particularly if somebody doesn't drive? So that's a great question, and as Jan is thinking about that answer, I do want to remind everybody that we keep this question segment brief, and if we didn't get an a chance to answer your question, again, you can reach out to Raynaud's or if it's needy med relations related, you can reach out to us, but we will also follow up with you via email. So Jan, I'm going to turn that over to you and see if you do have an answer to that creative question, which is, again, how to address Raynaud's issues for those who use mobility devices, where they need to use um, their hands for both dexterity and they need warmth. Okay, so one of the things I do, um, so my hands are contracted, and I, you know, you have to worry about the pressure that you're putting on your hands because that can actually cause blanching, can lead to a Raynaud's attack. I cushion my, um, my, mo my mobility tools with a foamy material, which helps me handle them better without them putting strain on my fingers. Um, and I think that really helps. And even on um, things in the house, I have... I've, I've, I've gone through my kitchen, and what I've done is certain buttons that are hard for me to use or certain things I use to cook, they're all padded, so I don't have that pressure of the, of the tool on my fingers when I'm using it repeatedly. I hope that answers your question. Um, That's a great question, and it looks like... It, um... Yeah, it was an absolute great and thorough answer to the question, as always. So with that, as I said, we're going to go ahead and wrap up today's presentation. I want to thank Jan for, again, taking time out of her busy schedule to share her expertise with the Needy Meds audience. And I want to thank our audience for taking time out of their day to join us and participate in today's presentation. We do hope we see you at future Needy Meds webinars. And with that, have a wonderful rest of the day. Take care and thank you. Thank you.